Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for, for joining us today and for sticking with us, uh, especially the people in time zones uh, where you're up early or out late. Uh, and thank you so much to all the panelists. These have been just fantastic discussions. Thanks also to um, the United Nations Sustainable Development um, Solutions Network and the Springer Nature for bringing us all together today. Uh, my name is Laura Helmuth. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Scientific American, and I'm here with uh, Jeffrey Sachs, who's University Professor at Columbia University. And we're here to have kind of a final discussion to try and you know, pull out some of the most important points of the, of the discussion today. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, there's the ask a question box. You, you know, you're all pros, you've been here for hours now, so you know how to do it. Uh, we'll also be monitoring the chat for, for discussions. If you missed any of the, if, of the presentations today, or if you would like to share them with your friends, uh, the recordings will be available either here, uh, if you're watching it on Crowdcast or on YouTube. Um, so please do you know, share these, uh, refer back to them, uh, you know, there have been some just really important points made today. And so the, you know, we've, we've had three sessions, uh, one on food, uh, both aquatic and terrestrial food systems, one on uh, climate finance and how to, uh, how the countries and organizations that are most responsible for climate change can help those regions that are suffering the most from it. And they tend to be kind of different, uh, different parts of the world, different, uh, different communities and universal health and how, um, the pandemic especially has kind of amplified the need for robust health systems that uh, that consider the whole person, the community, the whole ecosystem actually. And I think one of the themes that's come out of all of these discussions is the interconnectedness. Um, these are these are global problems uh, with that need both global solutions and local solutions and local investments to experiment. Um, to see what works and to and to share learnings and to build capacity. So we're covering a lot of things here. Um, and I think, you know, some of the obvious, the, the biggest themes are equity. All of these are equity issues. They're justice issues. Um, they're how to make the world a better place, a more sustainable place. Um, and we're, we're guided today by the um, Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Uh, and, and especially all of these issues and everything we're dealing with that are big problems are related to the climate emergency. And in a couple of weeks, as, as several of the, uh, the speakers have mentioned, uh, yeah, COP26 is going to start in Glasgow. Uh, we're going to be talking about climate change, the climate emergency as a global community. And um, I think to start it all off, um, Jeff, you can you know, run with this however you like, but you know, what's anticipating COP, considering all of the subjects we've been talking about today, like what are the most important things for people in the audience to do? Well, thank you for including me. Uh, I'm very delighted to be here, getting a bad echo <laughs> of myself. Uh, but uh, l let me say one common uh, part of uh, this, which is uh, why you're hosting this wonderful session, is that we need scientific knowledge for any of these three areas and for so much more of what we're facing, whether it's uh, the food systems, uh, the energy systems, or health. Uh, think about Every step we take now requires deep scientific knowledge. We'd hardly even know about the climate crisis or understand it were it not for the underlying climatology, which today received uh, two Nobel Prizes in physics, after all, uh, from the computer modeling of the anthropogenic warming effect. Uh, so scientists uncovered greenhouse warming already in the 19th century, uh, a truly genius uh, chemist uh, spontaneous in 1896 with pencil and paper worked out uh, the climate sensitivity. Uh, but uh, in the 1960s, uh, the Nobel laureates today uh, worked out computer models of climate that showed it's possible to understand and we know now to control the climate system, at least to an extent, and we better start controlling it. I uh, think about, of course, uh, the pandemic, the fact that we had mRNA vaccines available uh, within months of the outbreak, going into clinical testing already, and now saving lives around the world is the result of years of cutting edge science. And, uh, when we think about uh, uh, the food systems, uh, there was just a UN food system summit last week uh, that was filled with uh, the science of ecology. 
because the way we're growing food right now is not consistent with the, the conservation of biodiversity, but it could be by uh, reorienting the farm systems and the technologies that we use. Well, I, I believe that on a very crowded planet of 8 billion people, uh, jostling and uh, putting tremendous stresses on the Earth's physical environment, uh, facing new emerging diseases, uh, being part of this uh, complex uh, web of interconnections of nature, uh, the built environment, and public policy, we better have a rigorous systems understanding if we're going to find our way out of any of it. So I think this, this is the basic commonality. Now, earlier in the day, Laura, I was uh, on a call with the uh, UNIDO, uh, the UN uh, Agency for Industrial Development uh, based in Vienna. We're launching uh, on behalf of the Secretary General of the UN and for the UN system, a new Council of Engineers for the Energy Transition. Because there are a lot of politicians around climate. Uh, there are a lot of uh, economists, uh, probably too many, uh, but there are not enough engineers whose voices are being heard about how to actually make the transformation work. And truly, it's only the engineers that really understand these engineered systems of moving to a zero carbon power grid, uh, moving to electric vehicles, uh, moving to uh, other parts of a zero carbon energy system. So I think this general notion that we need science and technology to be broadly understood in the public, not just in elite activity, but also at the center of good public policy is a major uh, consistent challenge across all of the sustainable development challenges. Our governments are not filled with scientists and engineers, let's face it. Uh, they don't necessarily understand these issues. Uh, they don't necessarily want to understand them sometimes, but we need the science and the technology if we're going to find our way out of the, the uh, complicated situation that we're in. Yeah, and uh, so one of the comments is, uh, yes, we obviously need scientific knowledge, but does indigenous knowledge matter too? And I, I don't want to speak for you, but I, I think um, you know, one, of the, one of the problems of communication is just what does science mean? What does research, what does knowledge mean? And, and I think absolutely that you know, some of the, um, especially in the food systems and, uh, and in, in, in the finance sessions, we talked about how um, you know, local community based and indigenous in some cases, knowledge is is also key to, to solving global problems. Um, so I, I, I think when we talk about science and scientific knowledge, we're not excluded. We need it to be very inclusive. And, and I, I, I would I would add a basic point that in indigenous communities around the world, uh, there are a lot of young, highly trained individuals who are combining indigenous knowledge of uh, the ecosystems in which they live with cutting edge uh, ecology uh, and other uh, new dimensions, which are extremely important. It's not one or the other. Uh, it, it is an integrated body of knowledge. And uh, I think the indigenous uh, peoples know this uh, better than anybody. Yeah. And so we, you know, some of the speakers today mentioned that, um, and we talk about a lot about problems, and it really is important as policymakers, as as journalists, as scientists, um, as as people with knowledge, uh, you know, across these these big problems um, that we're focusing on the problems and what needs to get solved. Um, but but there's also, I think, a sense of hope that there has been some progress, even uh, you know, in spite of the pandemic, or in some cases, kind of sped up by the pandemic, or made more. Uh, critical or more obviously something that people need to worry about because of the pandemic. Are there any particular, uh, you know, either solutions or signs of progress that give you hope for, for the, the trajectory we're on right now? I feel as a general principle that uh, we have reasonable, attractive answers for the problems that we face. Uh, the problems that generally are helping them to be understood, adopted, and implemented. But I would encourage uh, all the listeners, for example, to uh, uh, download and read 
the International Energy Agency report earlier this year on net zero by 2050. Uh, the IEA, which is based in Paris and is uh, a world uh, leading uh, institution for energy for today and in the future, wrote this pathbreaking report of how the world as a whole can make the transformation to a net zero energy system. And it's an excellent modeling. The head of the team, uh, Laura Cozy, did a fantastic job of guiding a team through a very, very rich study. But the conclusion's very positive, which is here's a path. It doesn't even cost more money. It saves the planet, by the way, which is nice uh, to do. So we'd be ready to spend some extra money on it. But the technologies are so good right now and uh, so available that we really can move to wind and solar. Those are the two predominant primary energy sources cited in this report and make a world not only in which energy is decarbonized, but in which economic development proceeds and people who don't have energy today other than chopping down trees will have modern energy services as well. That's just one example of the kind of work that I see all the time showing actual pathways, technologically based, quantifiable, measurable in terms of dollars and cents that says, yes, we can solve these problems. Sometimes the politicians don't want to hear it or they don't know to read or they've never really analyzed the problems properly or they have vested interests that they're trying to solve, not the common interests. But I believe that that basic uh, idea that there are ways forward which make sense is a general proposition about sustainable development. Yeah, and it, it's interesting. We've, we've had several examples today of sort of virtuous cycles where if you, if you invest in this sort of thing, it pays off many times over. There does seem to be a gap between you know, this sort of evidence-based, solutions-based um, ideas and policy. Um, you know, this might be beyond the scope of, of what we can talk about today, but you know, are there things that that we and you know, that listeners that that you know people are concerned can do to uh, you know push for policy that is based in science, based in evidence, based on thinking about a sustainable planet in the future? I'm so, I'm sorry to disabuse uh, anybody, uh, but I would uh, suggest that uh, if you look at how the U.S. Congress makes decisions, for example, it is not this rational approach that says, here's our problem. Now, what are the options? Uh, okay, among those options, uh, what happens if we apply A, B, C, or D, or a weighted average of those? What are the costs? What is our best strategy? That rational kind of problem solving is not the way things work, unfortunately. Uh, but they could work much more that way. Regrettably, now uh, it is uh, 25 years ago, essentially, uh, Newt Gingrich, uh, who was a speaker of, of the House at that point, inexplicably and inexcusably, in my view, closed down the Office of Technology mm -hmm. Assessment of the U.S. Congress because they didn't want to hear uh, what the scientists were saying. They didn't want to hear the real information. And left Congress basically to fly blind. Uh, and uh, maybe that was convenient for a lobbying group that wanted to continue to pollute or some such argument. But my word, can we put back in Congress an Office of Technology Assessment so that we can have some serious nonpartisan information flowing to the people who are ostensibly looking after us? They are our paid and voted representatives, that would make a big difference. Yeah, so we, we have a lot of good questions in the Q&A section. Um, one of them is, you know, so the, 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 this, this, uh, this event was brought together with a focus on SDGs. Uh, and we, you know, we picked three subjects that hit on several of the SDGs. And, um, you know, the, the, we're not on track to hit a lot of them. And, and the questioner says, yeah, I've heard discouraging words about today, about whether we're going to hit the, the 2030 targets for SDGs. Um, where do you think we stand uh, on, you know, are there some that it looks like we will hit? Do you, you know, do you think we're making good progress on some of the other SDGs? Is there, 
uh, how can we, how can we relate it to those those goals that you know, we really wanted the whole world to endorse and and sort of is ways to, to crystallize and you know in you know 17 different different categories this is what we need to do next so the SDGs are uh, what the world said we need and want in fact they came under a, a rubric a report that was called the future we want and they make sense uh, they say we should end poverty hunger have universal access to health care and education and uh, protect the environment among other goals these are choices uh, and when one analyzes the sdgs uh, again quantitatively and systematically in terms of the technologies that we have the financing that would be required the investments that are needed the sdgs are achievable but we're not achieving them right now because uh, principally governments uh, are not cooperating properly they're spending too much time on geopolitics, on war, uh, on uh, conflict with each other. Uh, they are not approaching the issue scientifically, if I might say, to ask, given that these are our goals, what is the best pathway to actually achieve those goals? I don't think uh, in the U.S. government we've had a cabinet meeting say, how can we assure the U.S. achieves the 17 SDGs, although we should some countries some governments are doing that but it is a matter of linking means and ends the sdgs are ends they are what we want in 2030 the paris climate agreement tells us what we want in 2050 then we need a rational process to say how could we get from where we are today in 2021 to where we want to be in 2030 or 2050. it's a fascinating kind of uh, research to do. Uh, it is basically creating pathways to targets. And I believe in that kind of public policy, but it's not the norm for our government. Uh, we can see it in our current debate in the United States. Uh, well, is this package too big, too small? Uh, that's what they're debating right now, but they're not asking what is it we want to accomplish and how much does it cost? Uh, and if we took that line, we would have a very different kind of debate. So part of it is helping our politicians uh, to uh, be better analysts, uh, to understand the choice is better, and of course, cleaning up politics so that there's less direct vested interests or even corruption uh, involved. Uh, the politicians, in other words, are making choices for us, not for them. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we're a little bit over time, so we'll have to wrap this up. I want to again thank all the speakers, um, thank the UN Sustainable uh, Development Solutions Network and Springer Nature for bringing us together for this global conversation. I want to say good luck and thank you to everyone who's involved in any way in in COP26 in a couple of weeks, and to everybody else. Um, you know, please advocate for. Um, you know, good policy for equity, for food, for for, for sustainable uh, development, uh, for universal health. We really appreciate your concern about these issues, and and are really grateful to all of you for the for the work you're doing to advance these goals. Uh, thanks again, and uh, we're really glad you could all make it. Thank you, and bravo to you, Laura. So important this gathering today. Good to see you all.